Hello folks, and we've got something rather special for you today because we've got two of these EK quantum magnitude water blocks that we're going to be testing and taking a thorough look at today. So you may remember back in Computex 2019, we were showed these brand new blocks. And again, they looked at them again in uh, CES and our coverage of the EK booth over there. And they're finally hitting the market. So we're going to be taking a look uh, in depth at how they're constructed, what makes them different to the previous blocks, where they sit in the market, and what you can expect sort of performance wise, uh, because we're going to be doing a little bit of testing. So we've got a whole new test setup just for these blocks. But we're also going to be testing other blocks in uh, conjunction with that later on. We're going to do like a big block test with um, a number of different manufacturers so we can get some proper data. But for now, we're going to be comparing just the magnitude versus the existing velocity blocks. So first things first, I think it makes sense to take these out of their boxes and see what's what. So as you can see, we've got two different blocks here to test today. So we've got the 2066 block and also one for AM4. Now, you can also, of course, use a 2066 one on uh, one of the 115X CPUs as well. Um, it has the same Intel mounting socket. What will differ, though, will be the mounting hardware, how you do it, and also the insert on the inside. And that raises a rather interesting point because these blocks are incredibly modular. In fact, the modularity is the main selling point because these don't actually replace the previous velocities. So the velocities are still going to be in the product stack, but instead this product is going to be sitting above them. So that will explain a lot about the higher price point that we'll come to at the end of the video. But the whole premise behind the magnitude is the fact that you can swap it out to fit your system for both aesthetics and for performance. So of course, one of the interesting things that's happened in the CPU scene recently is we've seen a lot of changes in the architecture of how CPUs are made. So they all previously were quite similar. You'd have a die in the center, but now we've got things changing up with AM4. We've got the chiplet design. So we've got Threadripper, the larger scalable Xeons at the very top end, which aren't features in this particular block test. But all the different uh, nuances of the dies now are starting to play more into the performance numbers for the blocks because you'll probably remember from other tests that we've done in the past with our kits, um, a lot of the water coolers perform about the same. Um, a lot of the time it comes down to almost within margin of error and it's probably more influenced by your fans and your radiators. However, there is still performance to be had within the block itself and there are some players in the market coming in now that are focusing heavily on performance. So EK is trying to make sure they get the performance crown and also win out on the modularity front for aesthetics. So starting with the aesthetics, since we can see this one quite clearly, we have a bunch of accent rings. Now these are all machined out of either aluminium in case of these ones, which have been anodized so you can get lots of different colors, or brass. So these have been brass and then this one's nickel plated. You also have white and black acetal ones which come on the blocks themselves. The, uh, these parts are all interchangeable. So if we take a look at the acrylic top one for the AM floor block that we've got here, you can see there's an accent piece that sits underneath the acrylic on the top here. And this does not come into contact with the fluid itself. So don't worry about these being aluminium. They don't touch any of the coolant. They're just there for aesthetic purposes. And you can buy these particular separate kits. I believe they're about 25 pounds, 25 euros, that sort of realm. Um, and you can interchange them however you wish. The stock ones come in these configurations. And then you can also swap out other parts too. So we're going to be taking one of these blocks apart, and I'll show you exactly that when we take a look at the performance. But you can also then change things like the base plates. So you'll see these ones here have nickel plated copper, but you can also get plain raw copper like this one. And this co copper base plate is the same across all these particular blocks. So these are all the same form factor, so you can interchange these fine. Same thing goes for the tops. The tops are all interchangeable. The things that really change, though, are the inserts and the frames. So unlike most blocks, the magnitude takes the actual framework and makes it into an aesthetic feature. So most of the ones you have are quite sort of universal. You have the same top and then maybe a stamped steel, just laser cut, uh, water jet cut stamp 
steel plate around the outside, and then that does all the compressing. These ones work by having the actual framework just sort of on the outside, and I think it's more of an aesthetic thing. It doesn't necessarily provide more pressure. Obviously, there are other versions out there, like the um, uh, some of the heat killer blocks that have like a full exterior work that kind of clamp onto it, along with some of the uh, acrylic top from like Bitsky and similar. So this is more just to differentiate it from the market, and it's a look which might divide some. Personally, I really, really like it. But if it's not your thing, it is what it is. But one of the other interesting things is how the performance can change based on the shape of the block. So let's go take one of these apart and I can show you what's going to be different on the inside. So inside the block itself, we've got quite a few different components. So starting off, we've got the top. Again, this is fully interchangeable. We've got the outer rings. This is the accent piece. Again, interchangeable. We've also got the, uh, in this case, the nickel plated base plate. And we've got a copper one over there. Again, fully interchangeable for these blocks. And then where it differs is this. And this is one of the new big things about this water block because this isn't an evolution or a sort of a new take on the existing velocity design, which has largely remained unchanged for quite a long time. This is a very different take on it. And what this insert does is it redirects the flow to the important parts of each CPU. So what they've tried to do is tailor the blocks to match the exact processes uh, that you're trying to cool. So the one inside this 2066 block will be different again to the AM4 one, which is also different to the 115X ones, which is designed to put the flow straight down the middle because that's where the best cooling needs to be for those particular CPUs. Um, it spreads it evenly along the fins for the AM4 and 2066 ones. Now the other thing that this does is it allows you to have more pressure from the jet plate to warp the actual base of the plate itself. And one of the things they've made a big change with is how they manufacture these plates. So currently they're using 0.26 millimeter gaps and 0.4 millimeter fins, but to add a little bit extra contact, which is very important, what they've done is instead of just finishing them on the mill, they've made a sort of a concave shape on a lathe. So if you notice, there's a sort of a rough circular kind of pattern to it. So these have actually been turned in a second operation on the lathe, and that means that the base is no longer flat. And that's important because actually the surface of an IHS of a CPU also isn't flat. They're quite often a little bit concave. So you want to have a convex shape on here to be able to match up with that and get the best possible contact. So other manufacturers are also doing this as well. So sometimes uh, you can either use just a jet plate or something to move the copper, because obviously this is quite thin, so if you put enough pressure on it, it will change the shape of it. Uh, and other companies such as Optimus are using uh, their high-end uh, CNC machining in a, a very similar way to get a perfectly polished but convex shape on the bottom of their plates as well. The idea being that having ultimate contact with the CPU should mean that thermal transfer will be higher. And we'll be putting that to the test later, but it does make a lot of sense. So as I mentioned, these inserts are swappable. Now at present, um, we've only got this same nickel plated one here, but hopefully uh, in the future they might come up with other different designs and different platings, different uh, finishes, because they did have a few different ones on show at Computex a while ago. It's also worth noting that you get a few different types of these jet plates when you have one of these blocks. So this is the standard one that comes in with the uh, AM4 bracket. But if your CPU maybe has a, a particularly concave shape to it, you can add a thicker one, which will allow it to have sort of a more of a um, convex shape to be able to match that CPU as well. So these blocks are designed to be taken apart and played with. So it's one of the parts that we were explicitly told about is they want you to take it apart, to change it, see how it suits you, and see what suits your cooling needs the best. So some other blocks on the market don't really allow for that. And the other thing that really strikes me is that all of this is CNC machined. Well, bar this piece here, but we'll let them go for that. 
all these parts are CNC machined metal or acetal. So there's no injection molded parts. There's nothing necessarily wrong with injection molding in itself, but quite often it carries a connotation of maybe being produced sort of en masse to reduce costs only rather than being used for structural or uh, integrity of certain parts that maybe are quite difficult to produce in another means. And some of the other blocks that have lots of injection molded parts to them, I'm not a fan of. And the previous EK parts had a, an injection molded insert that uh, basically redirected the flow and that would, I found often would get lots of coolant sort of clogged up in it. You'd uh, have issues with it being dyed colors. So that was a bit of a problem. I didn't really like that very much. Yeah, so it worked on the cooling side, but from a user point of view, I didn't like it. So I much prefer this particular arrangement and it definitely speaks to me from the machining side of things because that's what I love to see. And of course, we've been to the EK facilities, we've seen how they're actually produced. So it's really inter interesting to see how the focus has really gone into machining all these parts, the framework, the accent pieces, the uh, different operations used for the cold plates. So I'm really pleased with that aspect. But of course, it won't mean very much if the blocks don't perform as they're stated. So I think it's about time we introduce our new cooling setup so we can test it out. Say hello to version 0.5 of our water block test system. Yeah, it's a little bit jank in areas. Uh, we're still working on that, but it should give you a pretty good idea of how blocks perform. And uh, because we're trying to remove as many of the bottlenecks as we possibly could. Uh, so we've got two 360 millimeter radiators that are gonna be used just for one CPU. Uh, at the moment, we've got our X299 system in here. So that's running an overclocked uh, 7980X CPU, which puts out a ton of heat. So that should be able to flex our water blocks really, really well. We're also gonna be testing AM4 and in the future, when different versions of the blocks are available, we'll maybe also be doing Threadripper and similar. Uh, it's all being powered by a uh, Corsair XD5 pump reservoir combo. So that's a D5 pump for PWM. So that should give us a nice little control. At the moment, we're running Corsair ML120 Pro RGB fans. Uh, we've got the RGB turned off because you don't need it. And uh, these are actually gonna be swapped out later on for a bunch of Noctua 3K RPM uh, industrial IPC fans. Unfortunately, they haven't arrived in time for the testing. So these will work fine enough. Uh, they're good, strong radiator fans, so they should do a decent enough job. Um, obviously, we've got a little bit of additional cooling just over here for the motherboard because we don't want the motherboard to, to uh, cut out on us. It doesn't actually affect the testing in any way. So what we are gonna be doing, which will help us an awful lot though, is we've got all of our blocks arranged using these Coolant's QD3 quick disconnects. So basically, we'll be able to snap in and out from different blocks. So hopefully, we'll be able to use that for not only CPU blocks, but maybe also GPU blocks in the future and other components that we can do that. And then ultimately, what we'd like to do is make a proper homemade bench. So I'm gonna be designing one in the workshop and we'll be able to do all sorts of exciting things, maybe doing fan testing, radiators, the lot just to make it a little bit more thorough and have proper control over everything. But for the meantime, this should do a pretty good job. And then once the new fans have come in, that's why we're not doing the other blocks at the moment. So once the new fans have come in and we swapped it all out, we have a proper PWM control, a sort of semi-manual control rather than going via any motherboards and uh, things like that. We'll be able to do some proper testing and get those updated uh, figures out. So for now, what we're gonna be doing is comparing the older velocity block to the newer magnitude ones. So let's get testing.
So that's quite an interesting set of results there. So we started with the velocity CPU block just because we wanted to get a baseline level of performance that we could compare the magnitude to. And we've stuck to the 2066 platform largely because we're going to be retesting all of this properly again when all the remaining equipment has come in. So it makes more sense just to go with this just to see if there's any differences on the platform that they said would make the biggest difference, which is 2066. So overall, we had a Delta C on the velocity of 48 degrees Celsius. Uh, which is a respectable result given how much juice is going into this 7980X. And then when we swapped it to the magnitude, um, that dropped down to 45 degrees. Now, that's not a whole lot different, but it is a consistent difference. And it's worth noting that actually the differences between an awful lot of the blocks on the market are very, very minimal. So you'd probably be only looking between one and two degrees anyway for most of the ones that we've seen. So a three degree drop is somewhat meaningful, but at the same time, that's not really going to do anything for your system that the other one couldn't do. So just because you're running your system at 66 degrees versus 69 degrees isn't realistically going to make a big difference. And if you're overclocking, you'll see much more benefits um, from going with other techniques, I think, rather than swapping to a different block. We also thought it'd be interesting to try testing out what would happen if you reverse the flow. So one of the handy things is because we've got the quick disconnects on here, we reverse the flow just to see how much of a difference it would be having it go through the dedicated inlet port versus the outlet. And uh, whilst we did see a temperature rise of one degree um, delta C over the original configuration, actually that's pretty meaningless in the grand scheme of things. And you could even chalk it up to um, uh, just margin of error for the most part. So if you, for instance, have a run which is going to look considerably better or be much easier to maintain by going in the opposite direction to how you'd expect, uh, you'd be perfectly safe to do so and you don't really lose a whole lot of performance. Now we didn't test that on the velocity as well just to see how much of a difference it makes over there. But uh, I think it was more a point just to see is it really, really crucial to, to have it operating like that. Now one thing that was worth noting is we wanted to check uh, how well everything was mounting. and. So we've got the block here which is taken straight off and no changes, no wipes at all. And as you can see, we've got some really even coverage of the paste, both on the CPU and the block itself. The whole IHS has made uh, proper contact with the block. So I'm pretty happy with the mounting system, so it's not as if it hasn't mounted properly. Um, there is a case to be made. Maybe we should also try out the different um, jet plates, see if that would make much of a difference. But I don't think it's off the top of my head, it's going to make a huge, maybe another three degrees. So you're not going to look like you're maybe five or six degrees cooler, I would imagine. Certainly in our case, we saw our three degrees max and it probably isn't going to change a whole lot more. That brings us to the question, what are you paying for this block and is it worth it? So one of the things that this block definitely brings is a colossal price hike. And in fact, this is going to set you back 210 euros if you get the full nickel one like we've got over here. So that drops down to uh, sort of the 180 euro range uh, for the um, acrylic tops. But then of course this doesn't include any extra. So if you want to get any of the additional accent pieces or you want to upgrade one block to another system or change a different type of uh, plate, that's all additional costs. So in terms of raw value, it's not a very good proposition. Um, but I would argue that actually in terms of raw cooling potential, you're always better off investing money more into the radiators and to your fans rather than swapping out your blocks and trying to optimize and scrape every single little degree here and there. So what are you paying for? I think it's mostly down to aesthetic choice and the modularity. So one of the things that obviously is the selling point of this blog is the ability to swap out all the different parts. And that's where the cost incurred really is. So the fact that they have so many different SKUs and all of the machining involved in each of these individual parts, the fact that there's no injection molding for rapid um, production of an individual component each time is, I think, quite an admirable thing to do, but it obviously does come at an extreme cost because this is a very expensive block. So it'll be interesting to see how it applies on the AM4 systems and other ones as well. So we're going to be doing that next time and comparing it to some how the uh, other blocks on the market handle this. Um, one thing I didn't touch on earlier also is the fact that the acrylic ones are fully digital RGB. And this is an upgrade you can do for the nickel ones as well if you uh, swap out one of the uh, inserts for a different one and 
probably also the top because there's no point having a nickel top and RGB because you can't see it. Uh, and the RGB on this one is really quite impressive. So we haven't shown it here because we didn't test the um, uh, acrylic top because we were going just nickel. But it's got 30 LEDs, 30 uh, digital RGB LEDs. And I guess the idea is that can then be used not only from your motherboard, but then put into um, EK's new fan controller, uh, which has all the RGB control on that as well. Um, and so that they did look very impressive. They're very, very bright. And we will be showing that later on properly when we do the, um, the full test system when we're up and running. But for now, um, we thought it was quite an interesting test to do. It's not, I'd say, a game changer really on the performance from what we could see. Maybe others will have different results depending on how their IHS uh, was shaped. But certainly for us and our test system, um, whilst there was an improvement, it was fairly marginal. And quite frankly, you'd be better off maybe just by having a little bit more radiator room. Um, we've probably saturated it as much as we can because maybe we have more fans, maybe we could have a cooler room, something like that. Um, but if you want the absolute best modular system to be able to go with your block, then at the moment there isn't really much of a contender. And it'll be interesting to see how the other high performing blocks, for instance from Optimus, will compare directly with this one. So make sure to keep a lookout for the future videos coming out where we're going to be testing more blocks and parts in the future. And of course, don't forget to keep up with us over on builds.gg, Discord, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, because we're always going to be posting up new, exciting bits of information, project log updates, and we're going to have plenty of stuff around the corner that I think you're going to find really exciting. So take care, folks, and I'll catch you next time.